Welcome to Science Through Story. This is a storytelling workshop for Leakey Foundation grantees. It's part of our new program to provide career development support to our grant recipients. I'm Meredith Johnson. I'm the communications director for the Leakey Foundation, and I'm the writer, host, and producer of our Origin Stories podcast. I'm joined here today by our executive director, Cheryl Camisa, and our grants officers, Patty Moore and H. Gregory are participating virtually. This is our very first online workshop and we're really happy that you're here and hopefully no more technical difficulties. I'm gonna switch just to slides for a little bit. So before we get started, I had wanted to make sure that everyone can hear us. Can, can everybody hear me? Um, you can type in the chat window if you can't. Okay, sounds like you can. Our webinar today will be about an hour long followed by some Q&A. And I wanna begin by telling you a little bit about why you are here today, why we've invited you. Why does a science funding organization care about storytelling? Here at the Leakey Foundation, we strongly believe that your research project isn't done until you've told people about it. And storytelling is the best way to get people to connect with you and your work. Our foundation was actually built on the power of stories. Without Lewis Leakey's ability to tell stories, our organization wouldn't exist today. Lewis knew that storytelling was a powerful way to inspire and educate people about the work that he and Mary Leakey were doing, and he was famous for his ability to tell stories that enthralled audiences like the one you're seeing on the screen. And he got people really excited about human origins, evolution, and primate and human behavior. So excited that in 1968, a group of ordinary people got together and formed the Leakey Foundation with a dual mission to fund human origins research and share discoveries. And we want you, our Leakey Foundation grantees and future grantees, to have all the tools you need to tell stories about your science in compelling, educational, and entertaining ways. The storytelling techniques that we'll be talking about today will help you present your work in any state, any situation, you can even use these storytelling techniques in professional and academic settings like giving presentations or writing papers. The more comfortable you are with it, the more tools you have to share your research, the better. Also, you and your stories are the best way to inspire people to donate to the Leakey Foundation so we can raise more money and fund more research and more programs like our Baldwin Fellowship and our educational outreach. So today we're gonna learn how stories work. We'll learn about narrative structure, character, voice, plot, all the tools you need to write and tell stories about your research, no matter where you are. And I'm excited to get started. So I would like to introduce um, Sarah El Shafi. Great, okay, here's me, here's Sarah. <laughs> Sarah is a doctoral candidate in the Department of Integrative Biology at the University of California, Berkeley. Her research, based at the Museum of Paleontology at Berkeley, investigates climate change impacts on animal communities over time. She also works at the intersection of science and entertainment to make science accessible and exciting. She leads storytelling workshops all across the country for scientists and science educators, largely inspired by storytelling strategies used in the film industry, including Pixar. <laughs> she worked closely with people from Pixar to develop this workshop and we're thrilled to have her here today. So now I'm gonna hand the microphone over to Sarah. Thank you so much, Meredith, for that lovely introduction. Can everyone hear me okay? If you're having any trouble hearing me at any point, please just chime in on the in the chat and we'll make sure that we fix it. Um, I'm really, really excited to be here today. Uh, I was actually just thinking during Meredith's introduction that uh, many years ago when I was in college and I was just starting to get interested in science outreach and science storytelling, I actually had the, the real pleasure of meeting a member of the Leakey family. I met Maeve Leakey at a TEDx conference and I saw her give a talk and I was very inspired by it. So being here at the Leakey Foundation today to run a workshop on science storytelling with all of you is kind of coming full circle. So it's really a pleasure to be here. All right, so let's dive right in and to why use storytelling. We may, um, Meredith talked a little bit about why storytelling is important um, for sharing science with public audiences, non-specialist audiences. 
But let's talk about why we use stories to communicate science. How do we know that this even works and this is actually a powerful communication tool? Well, believe it or not, there's actually a scientific basis to how storytelling affects the brain. If we can get the next slide, please. Perfect. So a few years ago, uh, this was a study done with some participants who were wearing, um, they were hooked up to fMRIs, which is a machine that allowed the researchers to monitor their brain activity. So in this study, participant number one told a story to participant number two. And that first line of brain scans that you see in the slide, the areas of orange, are the areas of those two people's brains that were overlapping in activity. So the whether the person was telling the story or hearing the story, the same areas of their brain were lighting up. Then in the second round, they brought in the third participant, also hooked up to an fMRI, and participant number two, who heard the story the first time, retold that story to participant number three. And guess what? Again, the same areas of their brains were lighting up. That second line of brain scans you see are the areas between the three participants that were overlapping. So whether you were telling the story, hearing the story, retelling the story, or hearing the story retold, the same areas of the brain were lighting up, which is really, really cool. They were essentially syncing brain waves with each other, so to speak. Let's get the next slide. So in a follow-up study, or in another study, they took a bunch of participants, again, hooked up to fMRIs, and they broke them into four groups and showed each group a different type of footage. Group number one was watching some Alfred Hitchcock, bang, you're dead, high suspense, strong narrative. Group number two was watching a spaghetti Western, the good, the bad, and the ugly, Sergio Leone. Group number three was watching some light comedy, Curb Your Enthusiasm with Larry David. Group number four was watching footage of people in a park. Now it may come as no surprise that the people watching Alfred Hitchcock had the highest degree of intersubject correlation. In other words, they had the most overlap in their brain activity with the most frequency. So at me most of the time when they were watching this footage, everybody was thinking the same thing. Is he gonna grab the gun? What's gonna happen next? Because there was a strong narrative and there was a lot of suspense. So they were all clued into the same thing. The people watching the Spaghetti Western, about 50-50. And this is the figure in the bottom left-hand corner. People watching Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, about 50-50. There's a strong narrative, but it's a slower pace. So they were all thinking the same thing about half the time. People watching the light comedy, about 20%. They cued in at the punchlines, but other than that, some minds wandering. People watching footage of pigeons in a park, absolutely nothing. No overlap at all. So what does this tell us? If you're using a strong narrative, all of your, sub, your audience members are gonna be thinking the same thing at the same time. You're syncing your brain with theirs their brains with yours. If you don't use narrative at all, their minds are going to be going all over the place and they're not going to be paying attention to what you're saying or remember it later on. So there is actually a scientific basis to demonstrate that storytelling does affect the brain. So with that in mind, let's start our foray into storytelling by first thinking about building connections, starting with connecting with your science. Now, before the workshop, uh, we gave you a worksheet to start going over. And if you had a chance, maybe you started working through page one, these questions about connecting with your science. Now, whether you've had a chance to think about this already or not, um, it doesn't matter. And also, I'll just say right now, there are many pages to this worksheet. You will not get through this whole worksheet during the course of this webinar. Don't worry about that. This is just for you to follow along during our discussion today. And then we encourage you to spend some time on these questions after the webinar. So let's think about connecting with your science. And the next slide. Um, so thinking about storytelling, it's kind of like a form of, of story therapy, actually. Many people in the film industry, when they're first brainstorming ideas for stories for films, uh, sort of go through a similar process, thinking about questions like the questions on your workshop, on your worksheet here. What are some types of stories that you enjoy. And these can be any types of stories. They can be from films, from books, from TV shows, family anecdotes, folk tales, whatever it is that interests you. What are some types of stories that no matter how, times you, how many times you've encountered them, you still enjoy them and you keep coming back to them and you really, really just are fulfilled from them every time? What are the types of stories you enjoy? Do they have similar characters, similar genres? Do they take place in similar settings? Uh, do they have similar themes? So really think about that. And does that maybe reflect something about yourself, your personality, your likes or dislikes? And also think about what kinds of topics have always fascinated you. And I put a few pictures here um, from my, my childhood and my journey into science. 
Uh, when I was a little kid, I loved animals. And that picture on the top is me swimming with a dolphin when I was a little kid. I was just enchanted by dolphins. And that led to a love of nature um, and, and, and an interest in all kinds of things. At first it was just marine biology. And then I got really interested in paleontology. And I was also a huge movie nerd. So there's me at a fossil dig in college wearing a Jurassic Park t-shirt because that was always one of my favorite movies. Um, so definitely film and storytelling and my interest in science have always kind of gone hand in hand, uh, which is I suppose why I ended up running workshops inspired by film storytelling for scientists. Uh, and then now in my PhD work, I've started studying not only old fossil things, but also living things. So I'm a herpetologist now. Um, I study um, amphibians and reptiles and I study fossil reptiles as well. And as a way of studying how climate change or climate impacts life over time. So thinking about the topics that have always fascinated me has really helped me sort of bring my interest in science back to an emotionally, um, an emotional level in thinking about how am I going to connect with other people who are not scientists when I'm trying to tell them about my work rather than starting with the facts. And that's what today is all about. So what topics have always fascinated you? And especially what were some of the transformative experiences in your life that led you to want to be a scientist, that led you to want to study your particular field? So for example, I put that picture of me with a dolphin up top because when I was six, my grandfather, who was a fisherman, he took me out in his fishing boat on Christmas day and a whole pot of dolphins swam around the boat, surrounded us and were jumping out in the air. And I was just totally enthralled with it. And that was like, that's the earliest memory I have of being really in love with nature. So that was definitely a transformative experience in my life. And I encourage you to even, you know, think all the way back to your formative childhood experiences or at any other point in your life when you're thinking about the inspiration for telling your stories about your scientific work. And I realized that this may seem a little counterintuitive or feel a little weird at first, because of course, when we're trained to do science, we're trained to think about it very objectively and remove as much bias as possible and not make ourselves the center of the story. It has to be the facts, the information, the data at the center of the story. That is absolutely true when you're conducting the science and when you are reporting the science in formal scientific professional journals. But when we're talking about science with non-scientists, with the general public, or even just in conversation with each other, it's really important to come back to this you know, emotionally resonant aspect of our work and think about what compels us to do this work as human beings? What got you interested in this in the first place? What led you on this path? What set you on this journey? Because that's what people are really gonna connect with. And again, if you aren't using a story, if you're not using that emotional resonance, then people aren't gonna retain anything from what you're saying. And it's absolutely possible to do that without compromising the scientific evidence at all, without um, dumbing down or without compromising the science. So that's what this webinar is all about. So thinking about what stories are interest, uh, of interest to you, what topics fascinate you, experiences in your life, and also of course, how you specifically got interested in this particular project. Uh, if we can advance it one more, perfect. So what sparked your curiosity in this particular topic that you are trying to develop a story about today? Uh, maybe the particular topic for which you got a grant from the Leakey Foundation. So thinking about all of these things is a great place to start. What compels you to want to do this work? And more importantly, to want to tell this story for our purposes today. So thinking about connecting with our science, it's also really important to think about connecting with your audience. And this is, I would say, the most important aspect of communication in general is thinking about your audience. Communication is actually mostly about listening, even more so than you saying whatever you wanna say. And it, that, it, that is absolutely true whether you are talking to somebody in person, whether you are giving a talk to a whole room full of people, whether you're running a webinar for a hundred people who can hear me, but I can't see or hear you, but I'm still thinking about where you're coming from, who you are and what your needs are. So connecting with your audience is very, very important. So let's get the next slide. And so now we're looking at page two of your worksheet. Um, and again, we don't expect you to work through all of these questions in detail as we're going, but you can just follow along and then really spend some more time on these questions later. So the most important question with thinking about your audience is of course, who is your audience? Who is it that you are trying to reach with this story? 
And also important, what is the context? Are you speaking with somebody in person? Are you giving a talk? Are you preparing a blog post that will be read online uh, without you there in person? Are you giving a webinar to a bunch of people live and who will also be able to watch it later? What is the context of your interaction with this audience? Now, it's also really important to think about what are some things your audience will probably care about? And the more specific you can narrow that down, uh, the better. So if I'm talking to a general public audience, I can think pretty broadly. Um, and even if it is a general public audience, just for the sake of an exercise right now, what are some things that you can probably safely assume most people care about, no matter who they are or where they're coming from? What are some things you care about, Meredith? Um, I care about my family. Family, great. What are some things you care about? The future of the planet. The future of the planet, wonderful. What are some things I care about? I care about uh, my safety, the safety of my friends and family, my loved ones. What are some things that affect all of those factors? The economy, politics, policies, uh, health and the environment. So you can go ahead and advance. Yep. No matter who you're talking to, uh, when in doubt, these are some things that are always safe to fall back on. Pretty good bet that no matter who you're speaking with, you can probably safely assume that Everybody cares about the economy, safety and health, policy and politics, our future, whether it's the future of the planet or the future of loved ones specifically. Most people care about the continuation of human beings. Proximity. If you can tie what you're saying to the, uh, bring it a little bit closer to the particular experience of whoever it is you're addressing. So today, whenever possible, I'm going to tie what we're talking about to things that Leaky Foundation grantees might especially be able to relate to, like doing field work or writing scientific papers. If I'm speaking anywhere here in California, if I can relate it to California or here in the Bay Area, where we're coming to you from San Francisco today, if I can tie it to the particular experience of my audience, that's going to help them remember it just a little bit more. And of course, wow, everybody appreciates a cool wow factor, um, always helps to get people's attention. Now, in addition to thinking about who's your audience, in what context are you encountering them, and what do they care about, it's also really, really important to think about your goal. Now, what do I mean by a goal? If you are telling a story to somebody and you're trying to reach a particular audience, you probably have a particular goal in mind, or odds are a lot of goals in mind. Uh, like if you're trying to uh, tell your family about the research that you're doing funded by Leaky Foundation, what might some of your goals be? Maybe you want them to um, think that your work is really cool and that it's really important and that it's gonna contribute something really valuable to society and that you've made good career choices and that <laughs> you're going to be really successful and, 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 and probably have a lot of goals in mind. And, and without fail, whenever I find myself kind of getting stuck on how to tell a story or how to sift it down and I'm getting lost in the weeds, when I stop and make myself think about it, I always realize it's because I am trying to do too much at once. I'm trying to accomplish too many goals at once. So I actually write down all of those goals, even the, the most ridiculous ones, and I force myself to pick just one of those goals to focus on. So maybe when I go to my family reunion this summer, if I wanna tell them about the research I've been doing for my PhD, I will write all of those goals down, right down to, I just want them to think I'm cool and that I'm making good use of my time in life. And I will pick one of those goals. Like, I want them to appreciate why studying fossils are important. Maybe that's gonna be my number one goal for that interaction. And I will prioritize my whole story around that one goal. I will, I will craft my story with that number one goal in mind. And you'd be amazed how many of those other goals you can actually subsume under that primary goal. If I can convince them that studying fossils is important for any reason, they will probably also end up thinking that my work is interesting and that I'm cool and that I'm spending my time well. So pick one goal to focus on. That goal might be informing somebody. It might be convincing them to donate to your research or to the Leakey Foundation. It might be um, getting them to take action on something. It might be getting them to look at a particular issue in a new way. Whatever it is, one goal. And it can also be helpful to think about what might be some obstacles to those goals. What might get in the way of reaching that goal? If you want people to um, take action on something, what might be some of the things in the way of getting them motivated to take that action? 
So just think about those obstacles. If maybe uh, because of the particular life experience that my audience is coming from, or maybe they have too many other distractions uh, in the way of getting them to actually focus on what I'm trying to share with them, think about all of that. You won't be able to solve or overcome all of those obstacles necessarily, but just taking them into consideration and being aware of them as you're crafting your story can be really, really helpful in thinking about, okay, well, if, if they might be coming from this particular experience or they might have this particular prejudice or this particular preconception about this topic, like working with live animals, or they may not even be aware of what fossils are, or maybe they just don't think about geologic time on a regular basis take that into consideration and maybe work some of that into how you set up your story or the details that you include in your story. And that can be really helpful as well. So we thought about connecting with our science on a personal level ourselves, connecting with our audience. And now let's get into what actually goes into story development. Oh, and before I do that, yes, thank you. One more point I wanted to make uh, with thinking about your audience. It can be really helpful to think about a reference audience. And what I mean by that is, if you have a particular audience that you're trying to reach, say um, uh, policymakers or potential donors, potential donors, even potential donors is still kind of a, a large audience, general audience to think about. So if you can think of one specific person, it could be a real person that you know, or a made up hypothetical person in your mind that you would want, really want to get the story across to, that can be really helpful. If I am trying to um, convince whatever donors I might be speaking to, to give money to the Leaky Foundation, maybe I'll think of one person in particular, like somebody who likes to give money to causes, but is just not familiar with studying human evolution or is not familiar with fossil work. How would I get across to that one specific person, say uh, Brenda, the chair of whichever company? Uh, if you can think of one specific person, that can really help too. And Meredith, when we were talking earlier, you were talking, saying that there are many audiences that we would hope to reach with these blog posts from Leaky Foundation grantees, but there are kind of three specific audiences that we're especially trying to reach in most cases. What were those audiences? That's right. So one is people like you, grantees, and, oh, grantees of the Leaky Foundation and future grantees, people who might want to apply. The other one is just people who are nerds for human evolution, who <laughs> love to read everything they can about it and will be fascinated with the work that you're doing. And then the third one are those donors that she mentioned. And, you know, those go into different specific categories. We have major donors who just love the science, who already know the foundation and just want to hear about you. They care about you. They care about the work that they've already funded. And then we have the people that might not know about you yet, but we want them to care about you as a person and the work that you're doing so that they might be inspired to give any amount, even a dollar, so yeah. Awesome, so thinking about those three major audiences that you might be trying to reach, um, enthusiasts, potential donors, and potential future grantees, I think uh, for the sake of our exercises today, Let's try, let's start by thinking about potential donors. Because if you think about reaching potential donors with your story, you'll probably be able to also capture those other audiences with any story that you might craft with potential donors in mind. Any story that you craft for a potential donor, you're going to assume that they are interested in science, but they, or they, they're at least generally interested in science and they're curious about what you do, but they probably don't know about a lot of the specifics. So including those specifics certainly won't alienate the enthusiasts who may or may not know a little bit more about the particulars of your field. But you know, speaking for myself, I've been studying science for over a decade and I still appreciate the refresher of the details. So I don't think you need to worry about alienating those people. And same goes for potential grantees. Um, potential grantees want to see that what you're doing is really interesting and really exciting. And even potential grantees applying for a grant from the Leakey Foundation are gonna be coming from lots of different backgrounds and experiences. So I think using potential donors as a reference audience or a particular target audience for our purposes today is a great place to start. Okay, so now let's get into the nitty gritty of what actually goes into structuring a story.
Terrific. Okay. So let's advance. All right. As we're thinking about story structure, I'd like to start with one of my favorite quotes ever. A good story cannot be devised. It has to be distilled. That's a quote from Raymond Chandler, who is a famous gumshoe detective novelist. A good story cannot be devised. It has to be distilled. This is not about injecting story into science or devising a story out of science where there is none. There is always a story in any scientific topic, in any scientific study. Really, really awesome stories. So our, our challenge is simply to take all of that material that we have to work with, all of the different details and aspects that you could include in your story, and to distill whatever version of that story is going to be the most cogent, the most cohesive, the most compelling story that you could tell for your particular audience that you're trying to reach with your particular goal or goals in mind. So let's explore story structure now by distilling it bit by bit. So let's start with kind of the big picture of what story looks like. You may have heard of the dramatic arc. Uh, dramatic arc is a term widely used when talking about story structure, narrative structure. Um, the term was coined by a German theorist named Gustav Freytag, who wrote, who studied stories from all over the place, especially like Aristotle and Shakespeare. And he noted that many stories have this kind of dramatic arc of rising and falling tension over time. So the story might start with some exposition at the beginning, the introduction, if you will, setting the scene, introducing the characters, explaining how this world works and what's going on. And then there'll be an inciting incident that catalyzes the story into motion. Usually some event that changes the situation for the main character or characters, often either by presenting a new opportunity or a new threat to that character's objective. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. And then the action rises over time with the tension building over time, coming to a head at the climax where all is revealed either, either for better or worse. And then there's some falling action as we find the outcomes of that climactic event and then some kind of resolution or lack of resolution at the end. So if we're telling a story about a scientific study, for example, if the next slide, our dramatic arc might perhaps look something like this. And note that many stories aren't gonna have just one arc up and down. It's gonna be a whole series of arcs rising more and more tension over time. So maybe our exposition at the beginning of our story about a scientific study would be uh, our topic of interest, what got us interested in this question, an existing problem that we're trying to address, maybe a lack of information in a particular area, for example, the background research that we did. And perhaps our inciting incident is that new question that we want to investigate. And maybe our rising tension at first is going to be trying to find the right study group or the right study area or the right field site to conduct the work. Oh, but then we ran into a complication. Oh no, we couldn't get the permits. Our Jeep got stuck in a river, whatever happened. And then we need to adjust our methods or adjust our plan. Then the tension is gonna rise again. And oh, finally something worked. We got some results. Maybe that's the climax. And then the falling action is gonna be figuring out what are the implications of these results that we got, of this study that we did. What have we learned from all of this? And then, and then arriving at some broad message or, or new knowledge at the end. And all of these figures, by the way, are from that paper that we shared with you in advance of this webinar, um, Making Science Meaningful for Broad Audiences Through Stories. So that's dramatic arc. Uh, another commonly referred to um, story format is commonly known as the hero's journey. Now this is based on work from an anthropologist named Joseph Campbell, who in the mid 20th century studied stories from all over the world going back centuries. And he found that many of these stories had common elements to them. Um, and he always illustrated this as kind of a circle, a circular journey. We start in a familiar world or familiar situation um, that is something that is familiar to the main character who can be anybody, male or female, human, non-human, doesn't matter. A familiar world or familiar situation. And then that main character receives a call to adventure, something that is beckoning them to enter a new situation or a new world. And they might even refuse that call at first, but then something compels them to, to uh, answer it and go on this journey. And they enter this new world or new situation where they encounter new trials and obstacles and they have to overcome them or not. And they are transformed in the process. And at the end of the story, they end up returning to that familiar world where they started, or maybe just to a situation that is more familiar to them where they feel like, okay, I'm, 
I'm back on solid ground now, but they have changed in the process. They have been transformed. They have new knowledge about the world and of themselves. And this format was, was famously popularized when George Lucas used the formula very explicitly to write the script for the first Star Wars film, A New Hope. Luke Skywalker starts in a familiar situation to him, a familiar world, Tatooine, which is familiar to him, not to us. It's a different planet, but even their aspects of that planet are familiar to us. And then he receives a call to adventure, the R2-D2's message, help me Obi-Wan Kenobi, you're my only hope, the message from Princess Leia. And then he enters this new world of entering the fight against the rebellion and goes into the Death Star and trials and transformations and all this stuff happens. And if you haven't seen the first Star Wars film, A New Hope, I highly recommend it because it's a great movie. And also it's a wonderful demonstration of these basic storytelling elements and structures that we're talking about here today. Uh, let's get the next slide. So if we want to distill that hero, that hero's journey structure even further, you can summarize it with these simple lines. Once upon a time, blank. Every day, blank. But then one day, there's your inciting incident. And because of that, something happened. Because of that, because of that, until finally, ever since then. So for example, once upon a time, there was a scientist who wanted to study anthropology. Every day, they read books and uh, articles, and they wished that they could go into the field and do really cool field work. But one day they saw an announcement that the Leakey Foundation was accepting applications for grants. Because of that, they applied for a grant. Because of that, they got a grant. Because of that, they went into the field and did all this amazing work until finally they got some results and they published them. And ever since then, they've been a scientist who goes around the world sharing their work with public audiences. There we go. <laughs> so it's a very, very straightforward. Um, and this distillation of story structure was created by Ken Adams, who is an improv instructor. And it's just a really, really quick, easy way that you can use to think about structuring your story. If we want to distill this even further, I highly recommend these books by my good friend and mentor, Randy Olson. Randy Olson is actually a scientist. He was a tenured professor, and he decided to leave tenure and go to film school to become a filmmaker because he really wanted to focus on telling effective science stories. And now he works full time running uh, training workshops, helping other scientists become better storytellers as well. Um, and so he's written three great books. I highly recommend them all, especially the most recent one, Houston, We Have a Narrative. Uh, that's kind of the summary of, of his whole uh, career's work investigating this stuff. And Randy's whole platform is talking about the simplest storytelling format I've encountered and but therefore. It is an even further distillation of that dramatic arc, the hero's journey, the story spine, into simply, we know this, and we know this, but we don't know this, therefore we did this. Or we had this character in this situation, and every day this thing happened, but then this different thing happened that changed the situation, therefore the character did this. It is so simple, but it's so effective, and if you pay attention, every good scientific abstract, every speech, every elevator pitch, every movie tagline, all of them actually have this and but therefore structure embedded in there. So I really encourage you to check out that book uh, if you wanna learn more about this stuff and it's a very, very helpful resource. Okay, now with all of this in mind, next slide please. Ah, one last thing I'd like you to think about, distilling even a little bit further. If you're struggling to think about where do I even begin, and this is now actually coming to the first question on page three of your, of your worksheet. If you're struggling to think about where should I even start my story, I could start it but when I was a kid, I could start it when I was in school, I could start it the moment I got into the field, I could start it at the moment of discovery, I could start it here now today, looking back on my experience, where do I even begin? It can be helpful to think about if your story that you wanna tell was a news story in a, in a newspaper or in your news app on your phone, if you were to see that story pop up, what would the headline of your story be? What is the, most, the single most important event of the entire story that you want to tell? Is it scientist discovers new fossil? Scientist discovers new thing about human cognition or chimpanzee cognition. What is the number one most important aspect of your story? What's the headline? 
and start from there. That might be where you begin your story. It might be the climax of your story, but even just identifying what is the number one most important thing I want my story to center around, that can help you think about, okay, with that headline in mind, and again, my audience and my goals for the audience in mind, where can this story begin? So before we dive into what that might actually look like, next slide, I do want to note that the, format, the formats that I just described, these are not the only way to tell stories. There are many, many storytelling traditions from cultures all over the world, and not all of them follow this exact format. Not all stories are linear. Not all stories follow only one character. Not all stories have to lead to a climax and then, and then come down from that. Not all stories are about discovery. There are many, many, many ways to tell stories and there are many wonderful storytelling traditions uh, that, that we have available to us and that we can learn from, from all over the world. I focused on these particular ones uh, because we only have so much time today and also because they are a helpful starting point. They are a helpful starting point for learning to share stories about any topic, including science, with the broadest audiences possible, simply because they are very widely recognized stories. I guarantee you that if you look at any popular film or TV show or book that has come out of at least the American film industry in Hollywood, the vast majority of them follow this format to some degree. Many of them have a hero's journey. Many of them have a dramatic arc involved. So this is not the only way to tell stories, but it is a very widely recognized way to tell stories. So when you're just getting started, I encourage you to use this as a starting point and as a frame of reference, because if you tell a story that at all follows any of this, and this is not to say you have to shoehorn your, your science into this mold, that you must follow this formula explicitly, you don't have to. But if you use any of that, if you choose to, you'll already be telling a story that people are going to be familiar with structurally, and that will really help them follow along. And then as you go with it, you can play with it, you can break those rules a little bit, but you have to learn the rules first to be able to break them, so to speak. So it's a great point to get started. So with all of that in mind, let's, let's actually brainstorm a story and see what this might look like. Oops, so we could. Yes. And actually, I'll go to the next slide first before we do that. Um, so we did share this paper with you uh, in advance of the webinar, Making Science Meaningful for Broad Audiences Through Stories. This is a paper that I wrote uh, as part of a symposium that I ran actually here in San Francisco a couple years ago on science through narrative. And we had scientists and artists speaking on the same platform. Um, so this paper is kind of a distillation of a lot of things that I've learned from running workshops and that I put into my workshops and much of what we just discussed uh, is discussed in this paper. Another thing that um, the paper goes through and that we're going to think about now as we're brainstorming is these essential elements of science stories. So we talked about dramatic arc, we talked about hero's journey. If you read any other material about storytelling, you'll find lots of different approaches to it, all of which can be very helpful. In my experience as a scientist, when I'm telling stories about science, and especially about scientific research, I find it really helpful to focus on these essential points. Who is your main character? What is that main character's objective? What are they trying to accomplish? What obstacle or obstacles are in the way of that objective? What is at stake if they don't overcome that objective? What is the inciting incident that catalyzes the story into motion? What actions does the main character take to try to overcome those obstacles? And what are the outcomes? of those actions. So let's start by brainstorming a story now together. Um, and this is really to show you that you don't have to be super experienced to be able to do this. In fact, you shouldn't overthink it at all. You should just dive in and start playing with it and see what you come up with. So to demonstrate that, we're gonna brainstorm a story now together, which I'm very excited about. I'm just gonna switch to, you can carry on. Well, I get this going. So for this next part, we have another special person joining us. Would you like to introduce yourself? Cheryl Camisa, Executive Director. Oh, thanks so much, Cheryl. Okay, so we still have the camera and the screen sharing. So we can, I'm just gonna make the Google Doc full, full size while you get started. Great. So, Let's start with a topic 
what are we trying to tell a story about today as an example? And who is our audience that we have in mind? Um, I think the audience we have in mind would be the board members of the Leakey Foundation who funded this research. Okay, great. So potential donors or existing donors, specifically the board members of the Leakey Foundation. Perfect. Okay. And what are we telling them a story about today? Our uh, research at Gombe National Park in Tanzania. Beautiful. Yes. So as an example, we'll start with Start brainstorming a story about research in Gombe National Park in Tanzania for our board members. And what is our goal for these board members? What do we want them to get away, get out of our story or come away with from our story? That funding our research had value and is important to advancing scientific knowledge. Great. Okay. So we want them to see that funding the research was really important for advancing scientific knowledge and had scientific value. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> important. Can we narrow that goal even further? We want them to see that it had scientific value in general. Uh, do we want to demonstrate that we contributed to a specific field of science in an important way? Why not? Sure. To um, primatology? Great. Okay. So we want to show that this research we did in Gombe National Reserve made really significant contributions to knowledge of primatology and of science in general. Okay, great. Terrific. Okay, so starting with our essentials, who is our main character? A 26-year-old secretary from England. Aha, uh -huh. okay. <laughs> Very specific main character. <laughs> Terrific. Uh, let's start with a story that we might be familiar with already. Um, so we have a 26 year old secretary from England. Mm -hmm. And what does this person who may or may not be named Dane Goodall <laughs> want to accomplish? She wants to live with wild animals and she wants to know everything about chimpanzees. Okay, she wants to go learn about chimpanzees and even go so far as to live with the wild animals to do so. Great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What obstacles might be in the way of her doing that? She doesn't have the proper educational training and she's young. She's young, she's a woman, she doesn't have any proper educational training. Nobody in proper their, their proper civilized mind at this time is going to encourage this woman to do this crazy thing. Mm -hmm. Lots of obstacles that she's working against. Yes a lot of uh, preconceptions and stereotypes that she's working against. Okay, what is at stake if she can't overcome these obstacles? What are the potential consequences if she can't figure this out or figure out how to get around these obstacles? The funding will stop. Maybe other researchers won't be given a chance. The funding for what will stop? Uh, researching chimpanzees in the wild. So she already has funding to research chimpanzees? Not at first. Not she at has first. To get it. Okay. So first she had that's actually an obstacle that yeah. she has to overcome. She has to get funding from somebody. Mm -hmm. What is at stake even before that when she's just starting on this journey? For her personally or for the world? Both. For her personally, she won't be able to achieve her dreams. Okay. And for the world, people won't know about chimpanzees. Why would that be bad? Why do people need to know about chimpanzees putting ourselves back in this time? Because they can help us learn about people is one reason. And because they're really cool <laughs> <laughs> and nobody's done it yet. They are really cool. No one's done it yet. They can help us learn about ourselves. Mm -hmm. So if, if this woman doesn't overcome these obstacles and figure out how to do this work and make this happen and get the funding to do so, we might not understand a lot of fundamental aspects of ourselves. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's a lot at stake here. Very dramatic story. So for stakes, we could simply write, uh, summarize that as uh, learning about human origins or human nature, however you'd like to phrase it. Okay. So let's try this out. We've got, we've got ourselves set up here with a topic, 
a character, obstacles, stakes. What is the main event? Now, quick note, you do not have to go through these questions in order. In fact, it can be very helpful to not go through these questions in order. You can jump around and play with them. And I guarantee that as you go through iterations of your story, you're going to change aspects around or realize that one thing might be fitting, one thing might not be fitting. So let's jump back for a moment and think about what is the main event that we want to make sure that we include in our story, that our story is centered around, given that we are speaking to board members of the Leakey Foundation. We want to convince them that we are making significant contributions to primatology and science in general. And our main character is this person. Mm -hmm. what, is, what is the main event that we wanna make sure we include in this story? I think we wanna include when she first observes tool use. Or when, Great. yeah. Perfect. Yeah. When she first observes tool use. Okay. So we're going to have our story. Let's make that the climax of the story. Let's try it that way. Okay. So coming back to our setup here, uh, what actually let's work backwards from that. Let's try it that way. What actions that Jane Goodall took, what actions led to that discovery of observing tool use in chimpanzees? Mm, okay. There were a lot of them. How many do you want me to say? Uh, name a few really important ones. Okay. She got herself to Africa. She and got met, to Africa. Met Louis Leakey. She met Louis Leakey. Uh, he got money for her to go and she went. He funded her field expeditions and she went and she spent time with the chimpanzees and then she made this amazing observation. Yeah. Great. Okay. What was the inciting incident? Which, what was the incident that set all of that in motion? She says it was meeting Louis. So okay, so me down. maybe meeting Louis Leakey was the inciting incident. Inciting incident is often meeting a person or something new happening. Uh, so meeting Louis Leakey and telling him what she wanted to do. And then he said, you know what? That's a great idea. I'm going to fund your work. Cool. Okay, so maybe that's the inciting incident. And then actions, challenges that she faced along the way were many, of course. Um, we're going to skip ahead a bit for the sake of time. So she overcame all these challenges, she did her field work, and then she ended up making this amazing observation of tool use in chimpanzees. And of course, what were the outcomes of that journey? Many, many. Yeah. Uh, uh, incredible discovery, uh, generated interest all over the world, and now we have this field of primatology and yeah, now all kinds so of many more people studying chimps. So many more people studying chimps and other primates and so many more women in primatology. Terrific. That is an amazing story. Does that story serve our purpose of convincing the board members of the Leakey Foundation that we are making important contributions to primatology? Absolutely. Yes. I hope so. <laughs> Why does that support our goal of convincing board members? We're talking about a person who did this work a long time ago. Oh. Yeah, so if we want to bring it to the current day, we could we could talk about the legacy of that and how since then new scientists like students and PhD candidates have been able to come and follow in Jane's footsteps, you know, all because of Great, perfect. So we just we sort of outlined uh, almost like one of the foundational stories of this field. Um, that we're that we're supporting research in, and a field or a story that continues to inspire the work of the Leakey Foundation. Wonderful. So that's a story that might be like the beginning of a conversation or the beginning of a presentation. Now let's bring it full circle to what is the lasting legacy of that story and the work of the Leakeys. What is the Leakey Foundation doing today? Um, so tell me a little bit about the work that you were you were both recently in Africa abroad, what were some of the things that you were working on there or some of the research that you were observing there? Oh gosh. Yeah, Cheryl, do you want yeah. to talk about it? Uh, we visited the Simeon Mountains mm -hmm. in Ethiopia, uh, met with five leaky research grantees. Amazing. That are all studying this uh, species of monkeys. They're making incredible discoveries and yeah. Terrific. So what, um, let's, let's say one of those researchers, um, let's, let's say one of those researchers is the main character of a study 
terrific. And yeah, we're getting some great suggestions in from, from participants. I love this. Um, let's say one of those researchers is a main character in a story. And like, if you wanted to tell a story to the board members about one of these amazing researchers that you met on this trip, mm -hmm. um, what was the main goal of that researcher? What are they trying to figure out or what are they trying to do with their work? Um, trying to understand um, communication. Communication between what or between whom? Uh, in gelata society. In gelata society. Yes. Okay. So they're trying to understand communication in this particular place. Uh, that's their objective. And what obstacles might be in the way of that objective? What have they had to overcome? Weather. <laughs> Weather. Permits. Permits. Um, the local culture isn't totally comfortable with this research being done. They don't understand it. Um, no one has really done the research before. So it's a fairly new research um, project within the last 15 years or so. Um, so that sounds yeah. fascinating. Yeah. Terrific. So there's a lot of potential obstacles in the way, challenging field conditions, um, challenges with even just communicating with the study subjects, trying to get them to understand what they're trying to do and to be comfortable with it and not give them the wrong impression. Awesome. Um, what, and what is at stake with this research project? What, what would the consequences be if they're not successful in doing this research? Uh, actually, the Ethiopian government may not give them permits anymore to do the research. Hmm, interesting. So we have lots of things at stake, including the potent, the continuation of being able to work in that area or with those people. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And then, of course, also, I'm sure, like, you know, having the being able to discover something new and learn something really critical about this culture or right. or never having the chance to learn that. Wonderful. Um, you know, to say nothing of just the success of this one field project. Mm -hmm. Great. So a lot at stake. Excellent. Okay. So let's jump ahead again to the headline. And maybe this research has already reached some results. Perhaps it's ongoing and doesn't have uh, an outcome yet or doesn't have results yet. What stage is this work in? Hmm. Oh, geez. I mean, it's ongoing. It's ongoing. Ongoing. Yeah. yeah. And all the different researchers might have results of, of projects and lots of people there have funding from a scientific question. So I don't Great. Know. Okay. Well, this is a, this is a perfect example to work with because many of you may be wondering, uh, what do I do if my research is ongoing? What if I don't have my results yet? What if I don't even have my field permits yet? What if I don't have an outcome to my story yet? How can I tell a story about it? Of course you can tell a story about it. There's always a story to tell. And often the unresolved stories or the to be continued stories are the most compelling stories, especially uh, if you're trying to reach potential donors, those are great stories to tell. So if we have this project, it is ongoing. We don't have results yet, but we have everything that we really need to get people hooked into it. We have the problem you're trying to address, what's at stake, what obstacles are in the way, all the challenges involved, Okay, so what might the headline, so to speak, of this story be? Uh, it could be as simple as researcher um, endeavors to study uh, society living in this particular part of the world or endeavor um, uh, researcher forms new relationship with what was the name of the society again? Oh, they're monkeys. Oh, they're monkeys. <laughs> Gelada monkey. monkeys. Oh, I didn't realize Gelada was a type of monkey. Oh, fascinating. So they are uh, a researcher um, endeavors to communicate with Gelada monkeys or to study Gelada monkeys for the first time. You said this is new area of research, hasn't been done before. Perfect. Um, yeah, so that could be the headline. Um, and maybe the actions leading up to that headline might be they uh, attempt to make contact with these monkeys for the first time. They attempt to communicate uh, or maybe the and before that there was trying to get permission from the Ethiopian government to even do that in the first place. And what could be the inciting incident uh, kind of moving or working backwards from there? Uh, maybe the inciting incident was um, finding out about these monkeys in the first place. How did they find out about these monkeys? Maybe they heard from a colleague that they exist 
and that they haven't been studied yet, or maybe they observed them themselves in the, in the wild when they were there for a different reason. Um, so the inciting incident could be whatever got them interested in this program or interested in this project. Awesome. And so if that's the headline, like making for the first attempt to even do this work, that's a great headline. And then the falling action from that could be, um, you know, trying to raise the money to do the research or trying to put a research plan together to be able to carry out the field work and find the field site. So whether it's a story that has already taken place that we might already be really familiar with, like the story of Jane Goodall and how her career got started, or whether it's the story of your work that might even still be in progress and isn't even completed yet, you can totally tell a story about it using these same essential elements. Terrific. Okay, back to slides. Back to slides. Oh, okay. And so, um, and I'll just mention, so if you're looking at the questions that you have in this worksheet that you can work through later, um, either way, question nine, it says, either way, what have you learned from your journey? This is bringing it back to the emotional pull of your journey. Why is this going to resonate with other people? Well, why does it resonate with you as a human being? What have you learned from this journey? And I'm talking beyond the specific scientific knowledge that you may have gained from the project. What have you learned about people, about hominids, about our closest relatives, monkeys and chimpanzees and apes? What have you learned about what unites us all, what we have in common, what makes us different? What have you learned about working with other people? What have you learned about the world and how it works? You can be as philosophical about this as you want or as literal about this as you want. What have you gained as a person out of this experience? Have you, do you feel that you've changed in some way from the experience? Have you created change in some way? And finally, that last page, page six, it asks you, if you like, to describe a particular scene or experience from your field work uh, or from your lab work or from any part of this journey that you've been on. Uh, describe it to us. Use vivid language. Take us there with you. What did you encounter? What did you smell, hear, feel? If you can use really vivid um, imagery or even just describing the scene in a vivid way that, that you know, engages all the senses, even if you're not literally engaging the senses, even just describing that is a really great way to pull people into your story and take them on that experience with you. Maybe you wanna start your story in the field. I'm in the jungle, I'm observing these amazing monkeys and I'm making sounds I never thought I could make, but I'm trying to communicate and it sounds like, it seems like they actually heard me. And then you back up and tell the audience, how did you get to this point? How did you get to this incredible moment? What led you there? And now what's the outcome of it? You can tell the story lots of different ways. So hopefully that gives you an example of how quick and easy and fun this is. Uh, and I say easy, I mean, it's easy and it's difficult. Storytelling is easy to get started with. In just one hour, we've covered a lot of the essentials with you. And now you have all the tools that you need to get started actually crafting and building your own stories about your science. Um, and of course, to really do it well, you don't have to be super experienced. You don't have to... Um, have, you know, of course you can make a whole career out of storytelling. Many of my colleagues in, in film and other artistic disciplines have made careers out of telling stories. Um, but you don't have to be super experienced to get started. And the more you practice at it, the more, the better you will get at it. And you will go through many iterations of any given story. Um, we just kind of quickly, quickly brainstormed a story about something that is just unfolding about a story that we were all familiar with. But if we really wanted to polish that up to present, to tell the story to the board of the Leakey Foundation, we would go through a lot of iterations of it. So keep trying versions of it, try it on different test audiences, uh, especially audiences that uh, are outside of your field. So try it on your friends, try it on your family members. Um, and, and just keep iterating and have fun with it. That's the most important thing. And don't focus too much on getting it right the first time because there's no one right way to tell a story. There's lots of ways to tell any story. It's just about finding the version of that story that is going to feel right to you and be compelling and cohesive while also including the science that you really want to include, but also getting at that emotional resonance that is gonna get people really invested. So with that, I'd love to turn it over to question and answer. And we are at um, 11 o'clock, our local time, uh, for an hour. So we will be recording the question and answer session. 
Um, and if you need to go now, you can tune in, uh, watch the recorded Q&A session later. Um, but for those of you who can stick around for a bit, we'd love to take any questions you have. And, um, and I'll turn it over to Meredith. Okay, I'm just gonna navigate over to the Q&A tab. Terrific. Clumsily, and then we can get started. <laughs> Sorry, everyone, two screens, not the best for me. Okay, no questions yet. So do you have some questions that people frequently ask you? Yes, when oh my gosh. Started about I have stories? so many frequently asked questions. Um, yeah, so to get start thinking about this a little bit more broadly, uh, one question that we get really frequently, actually that we've already answered or kind of addressed um, in the last portion, a lot of times people ask, how can I tell a story about a project that is not finished? Um, and we actually just talked about that quite a bit. Um, yeah, projects that are not finished yet or that are still in the process, those are great stories to tell because they're, you know, the unresolved stories are often the most compelling because they're not finished yet. So everybody wants to know what happens next. And that's a great tool that you can use to get people hooked in and keep people hooked into uh, what it is that you're doing. Another frequently asked question that we get, um, especially with scientists doing field work in different parts of the world, is how can we avoid colonialist narratives when discussing field work and research? And this is, I think, a really important question, and it's it's not an easy one to address, um, but I know it's something that uh, even many of my colleagues in paleontology studying fossils of other animals uh, really feel strongly about, and many of my colleagues who do zoology field work um, in different parts of the world, especially parts like Africa and South America, and, and I'm sure many researchers who are doing paleoanthropology research. Um, and I think it is a really important question. So before sharing my thoughts, I'm curious to know what you two think about, is does this come up a lot? And what are some of your thoughts on how we can maybe address this issue? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's a very important issue. And, and in the past, in in anthropology, it has been a problem. So we're hoping that our grantees can learn, you know, how to tell narr narratives that are not only just like not colonialist, but maybe anti-colonialist. So yeah, that's my feeling about it. Yeah, I think um, I think even just being aware of that is really important. And I think it's really important that when you're when you're going to a place to do field work, and especially when you're talking about doing that field work in a different part of the world, um, acknowledging that it, it, you're not swooping in with all the answers, or you're not uh, arriving to kind of save people from ignorance, or um, you know, bringing resources that they don't have, or uh, you know, it's like that's not what the work is about. Um, and always acknowledging how very important it is to work with people who live in that part of the world that you're working um, and how, you know, how essential they are to the success of the project and to the knowledge that you gain um, and emphasizing whether you're collaborating with colleagues in that part of the world or even just the people who are helping you out in the field, how very essential that is. Um, and also, I think... Um, emphasizing that, uh, you know, an, another aspect that comes up a lot is this question about um, taking like specimens out of a particular part of the world back to a different part of the world, um, maybe even housing them in a museum there temporarily, or, or especially uh, using specimens that were maybe taken out of a part of the world in the past and are now housed as part of the research collection at a different museum in a different part of the world. Um, it, you know, it's a sensitive issue, it's a political issue, it's a cultural issue, and it's important to acknowledge that. Um, and I think often the, the best thing that you can do is just to acknowledge it openly and, and even acknowledge that, yes, these specimens that we're using, um, they did come from this part of the world and maybe they were taken with permission, they might have been taken without permission. Um, but today, you know, thanks to international collaborations and, and technology, it's really important to work to make that that work, that material, and the information you're getting out of it available to everybody. Mm -hmm. So I have a few questions from people who are on the webinar. Terrific. First one from Stephanie. What do you ask your friends or family um, as you're testing your story 
on, you know, that you're testing your story on to find out what their feedback is? Great question. So if you're trying out a story on a test audience, say friends or family, what do you ask them um, to get feedback? So I would encourage you to uh, just say, I want to pitch my story to you. And if you like, you can tell them uh, who your target audience is that you have in mind. Like you could say, I'm trying to, I want to tell a story to potential donors. Um, so, you know, keep in mind that you are now my potential donor who is curious about what I'm doing and trying to decide if whether I should donate to my research or to the Leaky Foundation in general. Um, and then pitch your story to them. And one really helpful thing to ask them at the end is, what are you getting out of this story? What to, for you personally, what is this story meaning to you? Is there some like broader universal message that you're getting out of this story that goes beyond the specifics of the story that I just told you? So maybe if I were to, um, if I were trying to do that work on these monkeys in Ethiopia and then studying their communication, and I wanted to try that story out on a friend, I might ask them, what is this, what were you getting out of this story kind of at emotional level? What does this story mean to you beyond uh, apparently monkeys can communicate with each other and that's really cool. At a broader level that goes beyond the specifics. If that person says something like, to me, uh, it seemed like, you know, a story about um, trying something that might not work, but you care about it, so you try it anyway. Or maybe, uh, we're all more connected than we might realize. We have more in common with each other than we might realize, both people and things closely, animals closely related to people. You know, that's kind of a more universal message. And if they're getting something like that out of your story, and that's sort of the, the direction that you want your story to go or somewhere in the vicinity of where you want your story to land, then something's working well. If there isn't a clear universal message emerging from your story um, that goes beyond those specifics, then maybe think about. Uh, going back over your draft and trying to emphasize that universality more, or even thinking about like what what are the universal aspects of my story that anybody anywhere could really connect with, no matter what experience they're coming from or what background knowledge they may already have. Okay, I have another question. Great. Can we use inanimate objects like an oxygen molecule as a character in a science story? And what are the special challenges? Fantastic question. Thank you so much for that question. Can we use an inanimate or non-human object as a main character in a story? Yes, of course you can. You absolutely can. You can use anything as a main character in a story. Something like an oxygen molecule could totally be the main character in a story. If an oxygen molecule is our main character, maybe the objective of that, uh, of that oxygen molecule, excuse me, might be to bond with a molecule of carbon or to bond with another molecule of oxygen, or to go from a gaseous state to a liquid state, or vice versa. So it could be anything that oxygen molecules do. Um, what the objective is that you're focusing on is, of course, going to depend on what kind of story you're trying to tell and the whatever point you're trying to make. And then the obstacles in the way might be um, insufficient activation energy or not enough molecules of the other element available or whatever it is. You can make a story out of anything. What particular challenges does that give rise to? Uh, of course, the big challenge is to what degree is it appropriate to anthropomorphize a non-human subject? Is it okay to give human features or human attributes to something that is non-human? This is something that you kind of have to use your own judgment about. Um, a little anthropomorphization can go a long way. Uh, if you wanted to put eyeballs on that oxygen molecule or give it a name or talk about its hopes and dreams, that can work really well depending on the audience that you're trying to reach. So if you're trying to talk to an audience of small kids, young kids, and you're trying to, and your goal for those young kids is to get them to understand something about how, how elements interact with each other or how chemical bonds work, then a little anthropomorphization can really help them understand that. Um, and that can be really effective. If you're talking to the board of the Leakey Foundation, um, you might want to be, uh, you know, anthropomorphization could work really well with adults as well because it makes it fun and playful. The one thing you want to be careful of is that you don't want to use anthropomorphization to an extent that might actually interfere with the scientific topics that you're discussing. 
So for example, when I give tours of our, um, you, eh, our Museum of Paleontology at University of California, Berkeley, to, uh, to school groups even, uh, let alone adults, if I'm telling them about our T-Rex and I want to tell them something about evolution, I don't want to say something like T-Rex wanted to fly so it sprouted wings and became a bird because that totally goes against what evolution actually is or how it actually happens. It, it gives an entirely false account of how evolution actually happens. Instead, I might tell a story like um, relatives of T-Rex in their pursuit of food and shelter and safety and your basic things that all animals need. Um, so one of them, like some of them evolved feathers at one point, and maybe those were used for to keep warm at first, but then over time they started realizing that, oh, these feathers actually can help me fly as well. And then they ended up flying and that's how we got birds. Some version of that, that would be more accurate, but also still fun and making it a story with characters and obstacles and objectives and such. Okay, we have another question. Great. When your research narrative involves many working pieces and people, like it's a highly collaborative project, what are the professional responsibilities in vetting your story before you pub publish it on a blog? For example, information posted online might affect permitting, community relations, management concerns for non-human primates. Wonderful question, very important consideration. Uh, if your research involves lots of people and you're posting a story about your research online, should you check with your colleagues? Absolutely. Um, especially if you think there might be a chance that it could affect their ability to get future permits or um, affect their community relations, management concerns. Excellent, excellent point. Um, if you, yeah, if you think that any of those factors might be a concern, then I would definitely check with your colleagues before publishing anything public about your research, whether it's a blog post or a scientific article or an interview that you do on a radio show, like whatever it is, um, definitely you should always be in contact with your colleagues about how much information can be shared at any given point about this research. Absolutely. Yeah. And this is along those lines, um, writing and publishing a story before the scientific papers are published. How can you approach that? Another great question. What about writing or publishing a story before the scientific paper is published? Again, this is gonna be um, at your discretion and your judgment. Uh, and it, I think it kind of depends on how much detail you're going into about your work. Um, so for example, I've given public talks and I've done interviews about um, some of my own research and my field work uh, about projects that are not yet published um, in scientific journals, they're still, I'm still writing the papers. So in those cases, I am careful to not go into too much detail about the actual scientific results of the project. But even without going into those specifics that I wanna save for the actual scientific publication, I can still talk plenty about the experience of doing the field work, um, the experience of working in the museum collections where I was looking at my fossils. So I can say, you know, I study fossil lizards and fossil crocodiles, for example, and they come from the Western interior of the US and it's such a fascinating place to work in, uh, especially because when these animals were alive, the, that area looked like a jungle and it's now it's a desert and that's really, really cool to think about. So I can bring in a lot of those vivid details without getting into the scientific specifics um, in that case. And then after I publish that paper, then I can bring those specifics into the story, you know, in future iterations that I might share with audiences. So I think it just depends on um, what, again, what kind of audience you're trying to reach and how much detail you are at liberty to share at that point. But don't, I wouldn't let that stop you from talking about your work at all. Maybe you're just only going to talk about it to a certain level of specificity. Okay. We have a couple more questions. I'm gonna start with this one. Should the story be simple or could it be started or created in a complex manner and then you gradually simplify it? Like maybe editing it down or removing parts or I think that's the... Interesting. Um, again, I think it depends on the audience that you're trying to reach and the context. Uh, if, you're, if you're writing a blog post and you're trying to reach a, an audience with... Um, with a, a, an invested and sophisticated level of interest in your topic, then you can probably make it a little more complex. If you're trying to reach a broader general audience, I would opt for more something more uh, simple and more broad and, um, and focusing more on like the universal themes rather than the specifics. 
Uh, and it's, you know, it's going to depend on what you're trying to accomplish and also how long you want it to be. In terms of, uh, if you're asking about the process of developing the story, um, it can be, hmm, I think it can be, ultimately you want to go for less is more. Something that is more simple can really still uh, pack a, a big punch. Um, very often when scientists are developing stories, they're going to start with a lot of details, no matter what. I certainly do because there's so much I would love to talk about. And then over time, I distill it further and further and further. And I get down to what are what are the most salient points here that I'm trying to make? What are the most important details to include? And all this other stuff maybe is actually not so essential. Um, so I would I would opt for less is more as a default. Yeah, and there's a related question about story length. Is there like one length of story that will captivate people or does it really vary? Great question. I think it, it totally depends on the context. Um, there are plenty of great stories on YouTube that are seven minutes or shorter. A uh, story can be 30 seconds long. It can be as short as a, a joke with a punchline. A story can be a two hour film. It can be an entire 10 hour film se or TV series. Um, for the specific purpose of the worksheet that we shared with you for writing blog posts, I'll let you answer that question. Is there a particular length for these blog posts that you have in mind? Well, we like to have them like six to 800 words, not very long, and we like to have lots of pictures. Great, so yeah. Online, that really helps. Visuals are important, pictures whenever possible. Um, yeah, I would say in general for publishing stuff online, six to 800 words is a good length. You want something that people can read in like five to eight minutes or so. Okay, we have one last question that I see. Is it appropriate to take dramatic license and create fiction based on real things, like a fictional character in the past who might have been adversely affected by some event that like the scientists discovered probably happened while studying in the lab? Is it appropriate to take dramatic license or create fiction based on real things? That can absolutely be effective. Um, and whether it's appropriate or not, again, that would be up to your discretion. Um, it can be very powerful to use um, dramatized characters to tell a story. Uh, like for example, um, there was a really excellent series that came out on HBO last year about Chernobyl. And in that story, the way that they told it, they um, many of the characters were based on real people or depe depicting actual real people who were involved in those events. One of the main characters, um, the character played by Emily Watson, she was a fictionalized character, but she was based on the work of a lot of real scientists who actually worked on, on um, exposing what had actually happened at Chernobyl. And they found that for the purposes of telling the story in the series, it was, it was easier and more effective for the purpose of the story to have all of that work done by lots of people represented in this one character that they created. But then they acknowledge that at the end of the show that this person wasn't actually a real person, but all of her work is based on the work of real people and, and we acknowledge their contributions. So it can really just depend. Um, and I think as long as you are upfront about what is fictionalized, what is not fictionalized, and many you know, TV and films uh, do this all the time when they're talking about real events. And I think as long as you're just upfront about it um, and, and what you are depicting with your dramatization or your fictional character is still getting at the truth of what happened or what this is about, then that can be really powerful. Okay, that is our last question. So I think you have a couple of resources to share. Yes, wonderful. Thank you so much for your excellent questions. And, uh, and this has been just really, really a pleasure. Um, so just to wrap up, uh, as a recap, some of the stuff that we discussed today, we talked about how stories actually affect the brain and stories make information memorable and hold attention. Um, we talked a little bit about connecting with your science at a personal level, thinking about who is your audience and what is your goal for that audience. We talked a bit about different story structures that can help like the dramatic arc, hero's journey, story spine, and using those essential story elements, main character, objective, obstacles, stakes, et cetera. So I encourage you all to continue to play around with this, experiment with it, try versions of your story. Hopefully that worksheet will help you uh, walk through it. Try different iterations of it. Try them out on test audiences. Try them out on your family and friends and have fun. That's the most important thing. Just have fun with it and 
no, don't f focus so much on getting the story right. Focus on telling the story that you feel compelled to tell that is going to reach your target audience effectively. So a few resources um, to help you out. Um, if you go to, if you go back one, uh, if you go to my website, www.sarah-lshafi.com, um, there's a lot of resources available on there if you want to learn more about science storytelling and science communication in general. One resource we have, um, I've run a number of these science through story workshops all over the place, and uh, some of them I've even been joined by colleagues uh, from the film industry, including in this case, some colleagues from Pixar Animation Studios. And uh, some of those workshops, we've been fortunate enough to have some really talented sketch note artists in the audience uh, that took some illustrated notes during the workshop. So those are all on my website, freely accessible, and those can be available to you as a resource. Um, we also have, uh, I mentioned before that I ran a symposium on science through narrative with both scientists and artists from different disciplines um, presenting on the same platform about how do you engage broad audiences with science using storytelling from lots of different perspectives. So many of those speakers actually wrote papers, not just myself, um, but we also had a, a video game developer, a data visualization artist, um, and our uh, dance theater director, uh, several scientists who work with the animation industry, just lots of different perspectives. We had a team of grad students who started their own online show, a lot of really, really cool work. And they all weighed in and read, wrote these papers for you, for everybody. And they're available online open access, which I'm so happy about. Um, and they were written for anybody. They're written, they're published in a peer reviewed biology journal, integrative and comparative biology, but they are written such that anybody can read them and get something out of it. I refer high school students to those papers uh, for workshops that I do with high school students and they enjoy the papers too. So anybody can read them. And all links to all those papers are available on my website. And these are just a few other resources that I highly recommend. Um, links are also available on my website, or if you just Google them, you'll find them. Pixar in a Box is a really wonderful resource. Um, that's something that Pixar Animation Studios developed with Khan Academy, and it's available for free open access on khanacademy.org. Uh, they have whole units about math and geometry and coding and everything. They also have an entire season about the art of storytelling. And that was completely separate from these workshops that I've been running, but I love to refer people to them because even if you just watch all the videos, there's about an hour and a half or so of content. They're really fun and engaging and they cover a lot of great essentials about storytelling beyond even what we've discussed today. So that's a great resource. How to Share Your Science Story is another webinar that I was part of with my colleague, Nick De Palma at Space Time Labs and, and several other practitioners. Um, and then When Science Speaks, this is a podcast run by my colleague, Mark Bayer, and he uh, had me as a guest at one point. So those are all resources available to you online. And um, thank you so much for tuning in today. And if you're interested uh, in these Science Through Story workshops, you can join my mailing list on my website or follow me on Twitter. Um, I offer workshops to the public periodically, but this is actually the first time that I've done a workshop as a webinar, which has been such a great experience. And I'm really excited that you were all able to tune in. Thank you so much. And, uh, and I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you find it useful. And I look forward to reading your stories in the future. Great. Thank you. Yes, uh, like she said, thank you so much for being with us. And we also look forward to hearing your stories and reading them. And before you go, I just want to tell you, we're, we're going to be hosting another webinar with Sarah. Um, we haven't picked the date yet, but it's going to be about visual storytelling and it'll be a lot of fun. So after this webinar, you'll get an email with the video, the workshop, so you can watch it later, share it with a friend or a colleague, and we hope you do. We'll also send you a, a link to where you can submit stories for our blog, and if you have questions, please email us. Um, ask us anything you'd like about telling stories about your work. So thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Bye.